and thank you everyone for um, uh, you know scheduling this on the Sunday evening. I know that everybody must have other plans, <laughs> so. No, it's a pleasure to have you actually. It's really a pleasure to have you. Uh, we got it. We are live. We are live. We are live. Yeah. Okay. We are live. So yeah. Let's begin. Let's begin. All right. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. My name is Saloni, and uh, thank you everyone for joining on this webinar. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know me, I just thought I would start off with a quick introduction. Uh, first of all, a big thanks to the IATM team. I've been working with Ronex specifically, and uh, just everything being put together in such an organized and, and quick way. I truly appreciate that. Uh, but for those of you guys that don't know me, uh, my name is Saloni Verma and I'm a biomedical engineer. I've been working as one for the last, um, I want to say just over four years. So it's been a while since I've graduated uh, uh, from college. Um, and I work a lot in the medical technology arena. I work with medical devices and I work currently in um, New York. So I'm going to share my screen so we can just start off with a quick presentation and start things off with there. All right, perfect. So you guys should be able to see my screen now. Um, I'll just wait for someone to just give me a, a confirmation. Yes, ma'am, it is visible. See. Okay, yeah, yeah, it is excellent. All right, perfect. So a quick recap on my um, on my background in education. I did my undergraduate from SRM University in Chennai, and um, I had a focus on microfluidics and lab on chip technology at Harvard Medical School. That's where I spent. I would say the last year to an year and a half of my degree. Um, and that's really where, you know, I kind of finally realized that this is something that I like, uh, apart from just trying to get good marks and study for those semester exams in college. Uh, from there, I decided to then pursue, uh, you know, my passion for microfluidics. And I, and I thought that, you know, maybe I'm in a position that I still don't know quite a lot, as much as I would like to about this field. And that's precisely why I decided to do my graduate degree in, again, biomedical engineering uh, from Cornell University. Um, I had applied to maybe about 20, 25 colleges, and Cornell was finally the one that I picked, and I decided uh, to join. Um, it was a one-year master's program, and that's something that I, I personally liked because Cornell gave the option of finishing your degree in one or two years, depending on how uh, fast or how slow you wanted to learn. So I finished it in one year. Um, at that time, I had a focus on microfluidics. Again, that was my goal because I wanted to continue where I kind of left off. Um, and then also on the business side of things, because just that, that was something that I was interested in at the time and, and still am. Um, and then on the side, uh, I would say about two years ago, I also started a YouTube channel called Crazy Medusa, uh, where I talk about study abroad and just kind of help other students all around the world who are interested in coming to the US, Canada to you know, pursue their dreams of higher education. Um, so going a little bit into the technical side of things, I actually wanted to take you guys uh, over my research, my two main uh, research uh, that I did during uh, my college days. The one was at Harvard Medical School. So I do have a paper published um, on this research. Uh, I spent about a year or so uh, working um, in a research lab that focused on infectious diseases. And my primary goal uh, through this project was to design a microchip, basically a biosensor that could detect corneal ulcer infections. So even though this sounds like a lot of biology and, and being a biomedical engineer, you know, that makes sense. But I feel like I was involved with various aspects of things like designing. So I used um, Coral Draw, AutoCAD, uh, SolidWorks for the designing um, aspect and then moving on to additive manufacturing, which is basically creating the device itself. So um, soft photolithography, um, using laser printers, um, uh, uh, 3D printers, and all that stuff. And then finally moving on to actually testing the device. And with the testing, it, there came a lot, a lot of data analysis and trying to see how we're going to measure whatever we wanted to you know, test on the device. And towards the end of uh, this project, um, we kind of wrapped it up by wet, with Basically, when we were finally, you know, happy with, okay, we think we ha finally have a device that works, we actually used real mice um, samples to test it on our device. 
just to uh, prove out our initial hypothesis that we began with. So when when we kind of like look into how the skills and the technical skills that I used in this project compared to data analysis, I would say statistical analysis was the number one tool. I used a lot of graph pad prism at the time that we were, that's what we were using for this project because um, our goal was to get it published. So we wanted to make sure that the, the tool that we used for all the analysis stayed constant so that um, all of our regress regression and significant difference um, plots, all of them were constant and, and you know the same throughout the whole uh, project duration. Um, impedance spectroscopy is another way that we use to measure and detect what we actually wanted to. And finally, like I mentioned, chip fabrication uh, came into play as well. So a lot of like um, interdisciplinary skills were involved, not just like, you know, the biology. And, and when I was, you know, working on this project, obviously this wasn't something I was doing alone. I was part of a team. So we did have people from other backgrounds. Um, uh, a, a popular background that was involved was mechanical engineering. And I know this sounds um, a little different as to uh, how mechanical engineers can be involved, but even like right now in my job, uh, we I work with a lot of mechanical engineers for designing and and just like the basic uh, function of getting how we want to do things and and the biology aspect isn't as heavy in biomedical engineering and medical devices as people think it is. It's a lot more of designing that's involved. Um, so moving on to this, uh, I did my Cornell project with a collaboration um, with Johnson and Johnson. So here, the goal was actually to create this device that you see on the bottom of the screen. And what this device does is uh, we made a prototype, a working prototype, but the end goal was we make a handheld device that um, is able to assess tissue characteristics. And the goal was that device could be used for uh, people who have colon um, cancer surgeries. So right now, uh, you might be aware that if anyone has colon cancer, the uh, the 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 conventional way to kind of go about that is an open surgery where they use like they'll dye the colon and then they'll put some fluorescence lighting to see which one which part of the colon is healthy which one is not so the the unhealthy part usually turns into a different color and that is very like um it's not as precise as doctors would like it to be so the point of this device was basically you touch it on the part of the colon and then the device will tell you whether the colon was healthy or not healthy and the back end to how we made this work was through um, basically Arduino sensing. Uh, we created a code that would generate different uh, thresholds. So if the threshold values fell between this range, we, we claimed that the tissue was healthy. If it fell between another range, we claimed that the tissue was unhealthy. Um, and, and that's how we were able to do it. So originally this one was pretty simple. We were able to kind of test it on our own like um, arms uh, just to see uh, if we could even get the prototype to work. But uh, for the feasibility uh, and the sake of the project, we decided to test this on uh, porcelain tissue, uh, which was basically like uh, pig skin. Um, now, moving on to uh, a couple achievements that you know I had during my time um, at Cornell, and you know just afterwards. Uh, other than these projects, I was also involved with something called the Clinton Global Initiative. So I independently worked on some biomarkers that were being used um, to, uh, I guess, uh, treat Alzheimer's disease. And for that, uh, I was facilitated by the Clinton family um, in 2019, I think it was. Um, and I had the opportunity to go meet them in Chicago. It was a wonderful event, basically from all over the country in the US. They invited uh, students that were making an impact in global public health. And it was great to see, you know, um, all the projects that everybody had worked on and, and everyone's achievements. Um, other than that, in my current job, um, I work as a design engineer. Uh, and I basically, uh, in very simple terms, uh, the com or, or uh, we basically make anything into an automated product in the healthcare industry. And the way this works is we go all the way from like a basic scratch model of seeing, okay, so maybe we have this experiment that currently works in on benchtop and people do it manually if we wanted to automate this how can we make it into an automated machine and that's you know initially where i was saying a lot of mechanical engineering and design engineering plays a role because we work with a lot of like <clears throat> liquid robotic handlers and a lot of like other uh subsystems that are 
you know, apart from just like the biology of things and making them work all together flawlessly, it is a complex instrumentation system. And then the third part to that, which is present in the US uh, is the regulatory side of things. So when you have any medical device that you're trying to sell, um, there are levels um, of how it affects the consumer. Like for example, you have something like your Apple watch that you wear on your hand. Uh, it's also a medical device in a sense because it is telling you something about your body. It is giving you information, like it gives you your ECG now, it tells you what your heart rate is and stuff like that, right? Then you have more invasive devices like your diabetes devices where it pricks you on your finger. And that's more invasive because, you know, there's blood involved. It's again, giving you some information about your body and your health, but it is more invasive. So depending on those categories, um, as a company in the US, we are required to submit uh, whatever our proposed design is for a medical device to the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. And we have to get it FDA cleared, which is known as the 510K process, or during the COVID time, it was also known as the EUA um, uh, process. The EUA was emergency use authorization. And the point of the EUA, just uh, if you're wondering, is it was just fast, it was just faster. Uh, the, 510, the 510K process typ typically takes anywhere between two to 10 years, it can take up to 10 years to get your device cleared, depending on you know how invasive it is, because obviously the FDA will have a lot of questions. Ultimately, the point is people will be using this device and we don't want anyone uh, to get harmed. We don't want anything, a, a negative impact in our society. Um, the EUA, since COVID just you know sprung out and everything, we needed things faster. We were getting FDA clearances within six months because uh, devices needed to be out of the market for people to use. Uh, so that side of things is the regulatory side of things, which is also involved in, the, in a medical uh, device company. And that, and even though like my job isn't directly related to the regulatory, I've I've been able to learn and also contribute a lot to like just the daily functionalities of how we get this device or this product from. Uh, just ideation stage up until uh, it's approved, it, we're ready to sell, it's in someone's home that they're using it, right? Um, and I wanna say like the third bit of my achievement that I personally am proud of is the YouTube channel that I have. And uh, like I said, I, I started uh, just a little under two years ago and we've had uh, just a variety of different videos, mostly uh, based around, um, studying abroad and the channel is now close to 90,000 subscribers, which is great. Like uh, I never imagined people who really want to like uh, study and know about education um, are so interested in YouTube. Like mostly it's, it's just entertainment um, content, but the content I create is very much revolved around um, academic and um, education and studying abroad. And it's very, very uh, nerdy as I like to say. Um, now, other than the achievements, now moving on to more about how, oops, there we go. Moving on to how uh, data science and biomedical engineering are, are involved. This is something that I, I wanted to kind of go over because I feel like uh, there are a lot of uh, different areas and there's a lot of scope for data science when it merges with biomedical engineering. And in the next five or 10 years, I see this uh, growing exponentially. Um, the first one I would say is data analytics. And the reason I, I, I kind of put this here is statistical analysis is a huge part of any biomedical engineer's um, a job. And whether they're trying to create a device, whether they're trying to run an experiment, the end goal is how are you going to present those results in a, a qualitative and quantitative form so that it can be measured, that's one. It can be compared to other techniques and for future references, it can be kept as a gold standard or a baseline. So you need numbers and that's where, you know, all the statistical analysis comes into the picture. More recently, um, next-gen sequencing is, has been taking um, over and, and providing a lot of information. And for those of you guys that don't know what next-gen sequencing is, uh, basically about 10 or 15 years ago, we made a huge breakthrough and, and I, I forget the name of the person who discovered this, but he did win a Nobel prize we were able to decode the human genome. Now, what that means is um, the human body is made up of, of, of a lot of genes. Basically, it, it's basically a puzzle and a map that we didn't, it, it's a code. And about 10 to 15 years ago, we were able to decode and get the ATGC, basically the whole map of the entire human body. And with that information, 
you might have heard in the news that in the future we'll be able to uh, determine the genetics of our children, like basically create the type of babies that we want. Like, do we want them uh, to have a certain trait? Do we want them to be tall? Do we want them to have a certain IQ? Things like that, hair color, all of those things we'll be able, we'll be able to do because now we know what code goes into the human body or the human genome. Now with that, this is all 10 to 15 years ago. But now what we've been able to do is with next-gen sequencing, we're able to kind of determine, let's say somebody has a specific disease. We're able to determine in their body what part of the genome is causing their body to have this disease. If it is genetic, the goal is you cut out, you literally cut out that part of, of like the code and their future um, children or, or offsprings will no longer have that genetic disease. So of course, it isn't like the short term where you're saving that person, but the goal is it's a, it, it is a genetic disease. So without this technology, every single generation of that person would ultimately have that disease, right? So that's what you're trying to avoid. And next-gen sequencing right now, um, Illumina is a company that has uh, you know, just dominating the market in next-gen sequencing. But there is so much more that you can do with it. And, and I feel like uh, genetics, biomedical engineering, data science are the three fields that um, are, are called out for when it calls, when it, when it revolves um, that area. The next part uh, where data science would be involved is programming. Now, I wasn't someone who took a lot of programming classes in college. I took some, uh, the basic ones where, you know, you have to do, do, do them. But I realized that uh, as I was a part of like, as I worked in my job, I did pick up and I did, I was expected to learn a bit. And when we're trying to make anything that is automated in today's world, I feel like there is some amount of programming involved. Um, obviously just, you know, the mechanics and just having that there doesn't do anything. You need to tell that what you need to tell that um, component or that subsystem what to do. And that is a huge chunk. So that is one like, it's not directly data science, but I feel like it is something that kind of is learnable from a data science approach um, into uh, healthcare related jobs. The third one, and this is one of my favorites, are the limbs in the LIS systems. So basically, a lot of people don't realize this, but one of the big, big components is when you, when you go into a clinic, even in India, um, you step in, they take your registration information, and in some hospitals, what they do right now is as soon as you get, get as lo okay, one, as long as this isn't your first visit, you've been here before, as soon as you give them your name, they pull up your entire history. They know when the last time you were here, they know your medical history, they know what you're allergic to, they know last few times when you were here, what was going on with you, and then they have it all on their iPad or, or whatever device they're using, the computer, right? And then when you move on to the next department, let's see, let's see you, you go to get labs. It's all traveling from one device to another. It's updating in real time. That is the limbs and LIS system. And it is a huge pain to build. Um, we are, I currently am working with uh, setting up this system for one of the products that we have. And <clears throat> every time you want to put your product into a hospital, the first thing we'll ask is how can we, get your device and put it into our limbs or LIS system. And the goal is what they want to do is let's say that we claim through our device, you can get COVID testing done. They want to know that, okay, you got the results. How can it automatically go into our computers and go into the patient's registry? So we don't have to manually do it. So it's basically just streamlining the process, but this is such a huge backend, uh, a role that, that, that it plays. And specifically here in the U S it is, a lot. Nobody wants to do things manually. Nobody walks with a piece of pen and paper here. They all have their iPads. They all expect information to just in real time, you know, constantly refresh and upload. So that's one area. And the last part of it is um, image processing. And uh, this is something that, you know, again, uh, it's slightly different and more, I want to say in the last two or three years, we have opened up to the idea that AI can do a lot of this. Uh, um, things like, you know, your, your MRI scans or your CT scans, you know, anything that, that creates an image, even your x-ray scans, it's taking an image of your, of the human body and it's giving you information. So this in general is used for either predictive analysis 
or any sort of determining what diagnostic diagnostics so or determining if you have uh, some disease or not right now imagine if all of this this the first part of this image processing is we detect or we image and then somebody some actual person is required to interpret what this image means you probably would have seen in like tv shows and what not after they get the x-ray or the scan the doctor looks at it and he's like okay so this is what's going on right imagine that that second step was automated so nobody would need to look at it um it just automatically through ai the ai would spit out some data that says okay from the patient got this image and the result instead of an image it's not an image anymore the result is actually this is what's wrong with that patient so we're cutting out one middle step and streamlining the process and that's the whole end goal like when it comes to like healthcare and just medical technology streamlining the current processes is a huge part rather than just creating and innovating new technology i'm not saying that that's wrong or that's some um, there's nothing there're no drawbacks of innovation it's just that a more realistic approach of what's going on in today today's world is rather than new technology being created the goal is how can we use the tools that we have to streamline our current technology make it faster make it so that the wait time is less and if the if the technology is faster we can potentially save someone's life right that's the end goal and in general like in my opinion i feel like uh, these are four areas where uh, data science has the capabilities of merging with biomedical engineering um <clears throat> moving on to just some um non technical soft skills which i feel like have played a big role i i always kind of follow this thing called smart goals and this is um uh, pretty self explanatory it's an acronym for specific measurable achievable relevant and time bound goals uh this is something that uh you know always helps you uh uh whenever you're working on a project know that you're actually doing something that is ultimately going to create a difference um and some other like non technical skills or or non like bio related uh tools that uh, have always come in handy are um agile scrum and defect reporting skills so basically being able to track like let's say in a company you're working with different uh, groups on different projects so being able to track where we left off things on each project who was responsible for what and and everything so that way everything is just moving forward at a pace everyone knows what they need to do in case someone forgets you can always go back to this uh model that you have it's it's usually an online uh platform and see where we left things off um so with that i think i just want to kind of open up uh this uh talk to any questions that you guys may have thank you ma'am for such a lovely introduction actually uh, you helped uh, ronak a lot <laughs> so we had a lot of questions we had more than hundreds of questions we had uh, we had trouble figuring out uh, what we can ask so we have got some very interesting questions from the audience the first among them says that what are the remarkable changes brought by artificial intelligence in the domain of biomedical engineering and what are the applications of 3d printing technologies in the same domain especially sure. when we talk about image processing and Got organic it. printing okay yeah. um so when it comes to the ai i think right now currently the biggest uh breakthrough that we have made uh it's not it's related to healthcare but it's not related to medical technology basically i've seen that in airports um a lot of the airports internationally they're starting to have uh, holograms uh where instead of someone actually standing there to greet you uh they'll actually be just a hologram of maybe a person guiding you or if you step into a certain zone you'll be able to see just your flight information they they've created a zone that you know uh, direct directs you to your gate and stuff like that I feel like that is a huge breakthrough for medical technology um in ter- in terms of uh just healthcare in general because that in general can be used to such a big extent and far extent in helping um you know maybe doctors and physicians test out surgical procedures before they even need to practice it on a on a on a certain human being so through that holographic generation doctors could potentially create a a point to point hologram image of whatever 
procedure that they're going to do, practice before they actually go into and do that procedure. So that, uh, you know, reduces the chances of errors. It also provides um, physicians the confidence into what they're actually going to do. And in terms of um, image processing, um, what was the second part of the question? Actually, they want to know about the applications of 3D printing technologies, especially in the field of organ printing. All right. Um, <clears throat> that's something that we've been working on for about five or 10 years, I would say. Uh, so 3D bioprinting has been taken a, a big, you know, curveball. Um, most recently, actually, I've worked with a, a professor at Cornell who has successfully 3D printed uh, uh, an ear cartilage. So the way it works is basically instead of um, having plastic that runs through the 3D printed, uh, 3D printing machine, it's um, a series of uh, undifferentiated stem cells. And the goal is once you 3D print whatever you have, you can then connect it to different artificial blood vessels and connect it to an external system that then tells that 3D printed object what to do. And right now we've already made, you know, different um, specific parts uh, like the ear cartilage. And I feel like other bigger organs, like maybe the heart or the liver or the lungs, that's something that is realistically possible in the next few years. That really sounds very fascinating, like uh, 3D printed organs and all of those stuff. Uh, I, sure. I... Um, a lot of, um, so right now I've been working with, so with you know the current work that i do i see that a lot of like um young parents that are that are expecting what they started doing is they are preserving their um fetus or their baby's um uh, stem cells in in banks stem stem cell banks and what they what the goal is let's say the child um uh, for whatever reason is is born with some sort of a defect or uh, that child wants to maybe a couple of years down the road has uh for, needs these stem cells, they can then just pull that out. The only thing with stem cells is uh, only your stem cells can be used for yourself. So it does need to be uh, specific to you or at least someone like your parents. So, yeah. Okay. So uh, the next question I think we have is from uh, the segment Ivy League. There were like uh, more than 50, 60 questions from Ivy League. We have just uh, <laughs> condensed it down to one. So the main question is how to get into the college of an Ivy, of Ivy League. That's the basic question everybody wants to know. Oh, wow. I feel like, um, uh, you know, my, 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 my first immediate answer, answer is like, you guys really need to watch my YouTube videos. Like every single video is about this topic. Uh, but since I have you guys here live, I would say that um, growing up in school, I wasn't uh, I would I would say I was I was just slightly above average in my studies. I was someone who scored anywhere between eighty five to ninety percent, eighty to ninety. Let's be more realistic here, eighty to ninety percent. And um, I didn't beat myself about it. I was content with it. Um, but I made sure that I was kind of like a proactive person. I was super involved in sports. Uh, I used to play tennis. I played state level tennis, uh, basketball. I was a huge uh, sports person. So just in general, having grades is something that does, doesn't get you to the Ivy League. I, that's what I've learned. Um, it's something that is a first step. Obviously, someone who's failed subjects and gotten 50, 60 percent, you, uh, you do reduce your chances of getting into an Ivy League. But just having those grades, it's step one. After that, being able to write creatively, uh, that's a huge part of getting into Ivy Leagues. How well are you able to express your thoughts on a piece of paper? Because when it comes to Ivy League applications, they make you write so many essays and they ask the most simple things. Like <clears throat> if you're applying for a master's degree, they want to know what do you want to do with this master's degree after you graduate? And that really does make you think like, what, why am I really doing this? So being able to put your thoughts and your, and express yourself on a piece of paper matters. And then of course, you know, having a good set of extracurricular activities. I wasn't someone who, um, did a lot, but I feel like I did a lot in whatever I was interested in. Most of my activities revolved around sports and um, I just was able to show that passion in my application. And I feel like that is what uh, they look for. It shows skills like if this person really wants to do something, they're able to succeed. And it shows all of those interpersonal skills like leadership, teamwork, and those soft skills that they're looking for. So they're definitely not looking for someone who has uh, perfect scores. 
my GRE was pretty average too. I scored a 302 out of 340, which is, I, I would say, below average. It's nowhere close to the best uh, that people have scored. And I'm sure that all of you guys are, uh, are, are really smart people. You've gotten into IIT, so uh, I don't think uh, getting good grades would be an issue. But just focusing on, on creating a wholesome uh, profile for yourself, that just shows truly who you are, not trying to copy anyone. That is what I would say um, gets helps you get into I, IIT. And, and for anyone, anyone who is applying, I just recently released a course as well. Uh, so you guys can check that out. It's at incognitoblueprints.com. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your detailed analysis and for your detailed explanation. So another think, question. Uh, uh, Dipanjan, I have a conti continuation of this question. I would like okay, to go okay, for okay. that. Please continue. Yeah, please continue. yeah. so a uh, lot of people are asking that I am a complete nerd and I have not done much uh, during my school days. So what do I do uh, for the application? Uh, somebody has asked. Uh, I mean, in, I, in I, feel like, yeah. I feel like yeah. I feel like being a nerd is a good thing, right? So if you're a nerd, that means one you studied well, which is fantastic. The second thing is, if you were a nerd, you were obviously okay. You were obviously interested in nerd-like things, like outside of just giving the exams. What were you interested in? Just right, talk about that. Um, extracurriculars doesn't always need to be like sports or cultural or in that sense. It can just be what you're interested in. The goal is. Whatever your interest is in, you were able to excel in that field. It can be the most nerdiest thing ever, like maybe you were a big fan of superheroes or, or action figures or whatever, and then you ended up making or founding a tournament where everyone came in and, and showed off their action figures. It can be as something as simple as that. But what it shows is this is what you were interested in. You excelled in that activity. So being a nerd doesn't uh, pull you down. And especially since you guys are, uh, you know, in college right now, most of you guys, if you're planning to study abroad, will be applying for a graduate level degree. It helps to have, you know, um, research experience. That's one thing that I would stress upon, whether it's some, something in your college, in your own college or, or somewhere outside, it doesn't matter. Just research experience and being able to prove that if you're going for your master's degree, why should this college take you? Like, you should have a clear goal. This is what I want to do. Not just like, you know, well, I'll get admitted and then I will see. They always like to see someone who has a plan. So you need to have a good goal for yourself as to what you hope to achieve through that graduate degree. Surely, ma'am. So we had an interesting question. You spoke a lot about applications of data science in biomedical field. So there's an interesting question that is it open to everyone or is this field specifically reserved for a medical enthusiast and data science related people? So people want to know about the applications of data science in the biomedical field. Um, I think <clears throat> this would be open to anyone who has somewhat of a relevant degree. So not just data science and biomedical, maybe someone who's done uh, bioanalytics can be eligible. Computer science students are definitely eligible. And the reason I say this is ultimately you need to have some um, academic standing in some core or in some basic fundamental understandings, like uh, some a field that, that shows a little bit of biology understanding, basic biology, and then some sort of statistical analysis, uh, big data analysis and, and those kind of things. So as long as you're able to show those, even if you're in a completely different field, let's say a mechanical engineer wants to come in, but if that person is able to show that, okay, I've taken these courses or I've done this research where I used these tools and I enjoyed it. And you know, this is what I want to learn more about. I feel like that is a good way to proceed about it. Okay. Uh... I think uh, that question was answered quite well, uh, whoever asked, whoever wanted to know. Uh, there's another question. Uh, I think you're quite aware with the term FANG. It's a very common term in the IT world. Uh, so people want to know what is the IT uh, FANG equivalent of uh, uh, any company, is a set of companies, uh, any equivalent to FANG in the bioscience field or bioengineering field? Definitely. So the top companies right now, um, and I'll name them first, and then I'll kind of explain why they're in the top, would be Johnson & Johnson, Abbott, Roche, Illumina, and um, let's see. 
and Apple at the moment. So the reason why I name these top five companies is one, they have um, multiple headquarters all over the world. So let's say you do get um, a job in one of these companies, it's easy for you to ask for a transfer and little and literally just move to any part of the world. As long as you're good at your job, you tell your manager that this is where I want to live and it can be done. The fact that it can be done makes it such a big company, right? And the second thing is just uh, the work-life balance. Uh, all of these companies truly value their employees. So the the level of um, effort that they put into their offices, having like chill stations, basically, um, giving out free food and making sure that the employee is happy if you're traveling, making sure that you have everything you need. You're traveling without any restrictions. You can live wherever you want I mean, you can stay in whatever hotel you want like that is what you know it's the small things that really makes a person happy it's not about the money of course they do give hundreds of thousands of dollars in salary but i feel like that respect that you get as an employee is what makes them uh the top okay i think i think a lot of people got inspired to get into those companies uh, uh, apart from fang now because in a data science field, most of the people are planning to get into fan companies. Yeah, Dipanjan, I think uh, you had a question. Yeah. So next question is from the entrepreneurship domain. That's something which is very close to my heart. So people are very curious to know about the entrepreneurship options under the biomedical engineering field. Oh, there's so many. Um, <clears throat> so with entrepreneurship, it's, the best thing with biomedical engineering is as long as you create something that is linked to healthcare, it's cre it's considered biomedical. It doesn't have to be a medical device. It can be in the space of e-commerce. So I did something very different when I was at Cornell. Um, I took a majority of my time. Cornell gives you the flexibility to take any classes on their, on their campus. After you satisfy like the minimum requirements that they have, you can take any class on the entire campus. They won't say anything. You're, you're a student, you want to learn. I ended up taking three different classes from the Johnson School of Management, which is one of the best in the world. And one of the classes I took was e-commerce. And what I, my final project for that course was um, showing how blockchain could be used in the field of healthcare. So that is biomedical too. And basically my like goal was um, right now, at least in the U.S., one of the big things that we suffer from is um, identity theft, theft and uh, people's personal information being leaked, um, whether it's your health information or just your credit card information. It is still your personal information. Imagine being able to store that. You pay a certain amount, like a monthly subscription fee, but you're storing it on the blockchain. It cannot be hacked because no one owns it. So that was my final project. And and something as simple as that is considered biomedical. So the opportunities for entrepreneurship in the field of biomedical engineering are endless. And um, just recently, when the pandemic hit, the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health in the US, it's basically a big government funded body that funds all healthcare related um, proposals in the US. They gave out, um, I think it was either a $45 million proposal for the next five years that that amount of funding is going to go into biomedical related projects because if something like COVID happens again, we want to be prepared as a, uh, together as, as a world, not just the US, but you know, in general. And the big uh, uh, drawback that we saw why we weren't prepared for the pandemic was because nobody gave importance to this healthcare field. It was just there, you know? Uh, but ever since the pandemic, it has been growing, it, it's been getting funding. And that's the big thing. As long as something gets funding, I feel like uh, you can definitely progress it. So the entrepreneurship opportunities are big. As long as you have an idea and you're able to prove how well uh, that you can execute it, I think it, you do have a path forward. So I think uh, Dipanjan is, uh, already, has already started smelling money in <laughs> biosciences now. Uh, one more thing I would like to ask uh, is, is a question from my side. I think a lot of people will want to know as well. You just mentioned that uh, there was a project of yours where you used blockchain in bioinformatics. Could you could you please elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the course was um, e-commerce and it was just e-commerce. It wasn't e-commerce and healthcare or anything like that. It was just e-commerce. I pulled two of my friends and I'm like, okay, I don't want to go into this course alone. So why don't you guys come with me? So it was the three of us <laughs> from biomedical and everybody else was from uh, the MBA degree. 
and uh, we learned about blockchain at the time we were learning about crypto and it was this was about 4 years ago so it was still rather new uh, bitcoin hadn't blown up that it has right now and uh, we were learning about what it is how it exists and why is it so secure just because and why is it so secure and and third why are governments and banks so afraid of it because they will have no power over the people ultimately if this does come into existence it's basically as simple as that right so since it's just a decentralized network um it cannot be hacked into like what are you going to hack if nothing exists uh so that makes the security bit of it and our final project was to um just make anything um where you're using blockchain technology so be creative about it obviously the mba students went into the finance and the banks and the money and all that that's not how we think as biomedical engineers obviously um so we are like okay so what is the number one uh issue that you know people are facing when it comes to uh data or or just uh uh personal health and and information and identity theft is what came up so we designed it was mostly we didn't do any sort of like physical prototype it was mostly on paper so theoretically we designed a proposal where uh if there was this space that existed basically like ethereum right ethereum is used for uh, digital contracts so this would be this space whatever you want to name it could exist just to store people's personal information and since people are giving a monthly subscription fee the value of this entity whatever the space is is increasing day by day and as more people start to use it it keeps increasing and it's becoming more secure because the value of that entity is ultimately also increasing so that's what we came up with as a proposal um everybody loved it it was all the only healthcare based uh, project in the entire class but it was it was really interesting to work on it and i feel like you know we were able to learn a lot of the capabilities of what blockchain can do in general that's great to know ma'am so there is another interesting question we would like to know your opinion on dna editing with the help of artificial intelligence definitely so that would come under the crispr cas9 technique um uh, it's something that's already being done very uh, early stages but the crispr cas9 technique is dna is basically what dna editing is uh when you talk about dna editing you're either cutting out something or you're replacing the dna with something else you can't just leave it as is because that would be an incomplete dna um so when you're trying to replace something a part of the dna with something else that's known as that you can do that by something called the crispr cas9 technique it's a very popular tool in in genetics and right now um obviously you know the whole human body has multiple strands of dna so we're looking at a singular dna in order to do this for the for one person it would take years of research and years of a person sitting in front of the computer uh to identify okay this is the part i need to cut this is the part i need to replace it with so we have already created um kind of like a program you can say that sifts through this information and right now it's possible to do this in in one to two months for one person which is a huge achievement so i feel like if we're able to repeat this code a certain number of times um it will ultimately get faster and faster because the computer itself learns what they're looking for it it, ha- it already has stored a certain piece of information so that's how that speed increases so it's already being done and i feel like um the faster this happens the easier it will be for humans to change a lot of things which i feel like is not a good thing giving humans that much power in general <laughs> but it's just my opinion <laughs> uh i would i would like to uh, ask a continuation of this question that uh, uh, what are the applications of uh, data science in genomics or uh, gene mapping and fields like those definitely um so i think with data science that would be more towards like r&d as new companies are made who want to create instrumentations or who want to create uh this facility that okay if somebody wants to get their uh, dna edited or their dna read we will do it for you right like basically 23 and you if you guys have heard of it 23 and me what it does is you uh, spit into a tube it's an at home kit that you can buy from like stores here you spit into a tube you send it to them they will send you an entire and um like histor like basically your your family history of like your ancestors and where you're from. I I did this a few years ago. I'm like 98% Indian. There was nothing um 
uh, surprising or, or interesting. I'm like, I, sh- I should have had something better than this. <laughs> but it tells you like your, an- your ancestral history. And uh, when it comes to like gene editing, I feel like this is like expand this and blow this up into even more. Imagine like the same tool, but by doing this, you could uh, make changes like, okay, like I feel like I'm not growing enough. So I want to be able to grow another five inches. So you could do that. Imagine being able to do that. And I feel like as companies develop who want to do this, they will have a need for data scientists to develop that technology. So a lot in the R&D side of things. Uh, Dependent, uh, you can go. Yeah, so there's a lot of question regarding the field of bioanalyst job. So people are basically curious to know how, how they can prepare for a bioanalyst role and what are the skills required in this field? Definitely. Um, so for bioanalyst uh, role, um, I would say the number one skill is try to uh, get good with at least one platform. Anything you, that you want to start with. It can be something as simple as graph pad prism or it can be something that you're using in your own like um, in your own degree, as long as you're able to show that this is something that can also be used in uh, for healthcare, uh, that's all you need to do. So being able, being proficient at multiple um, tools, so Tableau, statistic, uh, other statistical analysis, and being able to also, um, so not just analyze that data, but provide suggestions as to once that data is analyzed, these are the different methods in which it can be presented. So this is where your um, R square values, your regression analysis, your um, uh, uh, significant difference graphs, all of those come into play. So being able to provide that um, suggestion is something that comes into in handy. Okay, I think uh, we had a lot of uh, bio and uh, data science related uh, topics discussed. I think we should get to a Ivy League question. Uh, Someone has asked that, uh, what is the importance of SOP and LORs while uh, applying to a college or university for master's or PhD programs? Oh, I feel like it's the single most important thing in your application. So typically when you're applying to a master's or PhD, uh, this might not come as the the best news, but you'll be expected to write uh, maybe even two letters of um, of statement. So one would be a personal statement. The other one can be an academic statement of purpose. And both of these are like two pages long each. So in this, you you are expected to one, talk about the personal side of things. And then the other one, talk about your academic achievements and what you hope to do with this degree. That's what they're looking for. So that's what you're expected to talk about. And I spent over eight to 10 months in drafting my um, statement of purpose. That's the amount of time. Like I would write a version and then I would toss it in the paper. I'd be like, that's crap. Like that is the worst thing I've ever written. Like when I wrote it and then read it back to myself, I'm like, what am I doing? So after like two to three months, I finally had a version that I was um, not embarrassed to show someone. (laughs) And then after that, I started getting feedback from other people. And even then it's like the most the num- more number of revisions you can make in your in your statement of purpose and your other essays, um, the better it'll ultimately be. Being and writing these isn't very difficult for masters and PhD programs. They provide like a paragraph worth of questions. Like this is what we want you to answer. So as long as you're able to answer all of those things and follow those instructions, the flow will come along. Definitely, if this is something that you're uh, you know hoping to do next. Um, start early and and don't spend too much time on like figuring out what you need to do. Just do what you need to do. Uh, that would be my one suggestion. And when it comes to letters of recommendation, they pay they play a huge role. And I know that a lot of um, well, I hope not teachers aren't on this webinar, but some some teachers uh, in India do make their students write their LORs, which is not the best way to do things. I'm actually working on a video on this very topic directed directly to teachers. Like, well, don't make your students do this. Um, but if your teachers do put you in that position, um, it's always good to give them like uh, a list of points that they could potentially talk about just to help them also through that entire process. The LORs play a huge role because the colleges want to see like from a third person, what does a third person think of you? So uh, that does help push your application forward. 
I think we really need that LOR video for, for the teachers. If someone is not giving us LOR, we'll just show them your video. Yeah. <laughs> So one more thing, uh, uh, we all know that uh, all the Ivy League colleges are very strict with their plagiarism policy and uh, they have a particular way, uh, automated technique to shortlist all the applications. So uh, what are your comments on that? How to, how to just prepare for uh, those things? Definitely. So um, obviously, you know, as, as we're all smart people, um, our first uh, uh, thought process is let's see how a successful SOP looks like and then we'll write ours. We never start with let's just write, right? So there's nothing wrong with taking inspiration. There is something wrong with copying. So the difference between the two is taking inspiration is you read someone else's and then you're like, okay, I could write my story in this way. That's taking inspiration. Copying is just straight up. I'm just going to replace this part of the story and just add my details. So yes, they do have plagiarism tools. Um, typically what happens is when you submit your college application, the first thing they do is um, run it through their plagiarism software. It's basically a software where you upload the file and it will tell you from the entire, on the internet, where, how much of it is plagiarized. So I think it's like 7% or it might be even lower slightly. That's what's allowed. And that is, um, you know, it, it's, it can be helped. 7% is the limit. Um, of course, there are some words and some phrases that may be similar. So they want to give you that benefit of doubt. But overall, uh, I would say it's fine for you to take inspiration, but try to give it your own spin and make sure that your story stays your own. Like copying someone else's uh, SOP or, or even like copying someone else's story really doesn't help the cause. Because the thing is, imagine if you're copying this person's uh, story, so, so are like 10 other people thinking of doing that. So that means that there might be 50 people with the same story. So that's not helping you be unique. It, it's just going to like hurt your cause even more. So people who have still more doubts, please do check Nam's channel, Crazy Medusa. The link has been provided in the you know, chat box. So now we have a question again from the previous field, which we have been discussing since the last 45 minutes. So how tough it will be as a person with no medical background to pursue a career in data science in the field of neurosciences? So Got it. your opinion or views? Um, I would say that high school biology isn't enough when it comes to uh, making a transition from a field like data science into healthcare. And I do understand that the Indian curriculum system is very strict. You guys are required to take a certain number of courses each semester. You may not have the facility to take what you want, but there are so many other options available now that if this is something you're truly interested in, places like maybe Coursera or EDX, you can maybe take some courses like maybe um, neuroscience, neuro engines, neural networks. These are just some examples. So the, the goal is you're taking these foundational courses just to understand the topic and be at the base fundamental level of everyone. So your strong suit as data scientists will always be data science. And that's what you bring to the table. That's something that nobody else can take away from you. But you shouldn't lack in the neural science department. So that's why you take some course. It can be a paid course. It can be a free course. The point is you should know that fundamental information. You should know that you should know it to an extent that, okay, I know this much and I know how I can apply my data science field into this uh, field overall. So that's the level that you need to know. I would say one to two courses of Coursera should be more than enough if you're thinking of making that transition. Okay, so uh, I think a lot of data scientists would like to know this, that we have already a lot of models, uh, AIs deployed in the field of bio and science and engineering. But uh, how, what is the accuracy of those uh, models and uh, things already in place and how much we as data scientists do we need to work to get them better? Um, I would say that the accuracy and precision isn't enough because the problem that we're facing right now is the robustness like uh, technology is great to a point where it's in um, a one direction field. Basically, if nothing changes, if no external variables change, that technology works perfectly. As soon as there is a variable that changes, that technology collapses because 
there it goes into a different path and trajectory and there's nothing around it to support it and a good example of this very basic example let's say that we have um a, a, we've developed a product that does covid testing okay it's an automated covid testing platform and we've uh, also deployed uh towards the end of the results we've deployed data science and ai so that once the results are generated it automatically filters the result and notifies the patients who have who are positive that you need to quarantine that's our product okay you have your system let's say that one day it's extremely cold in wherever you guys are sitting and it starts snowing just a variable i'm adding right temperature and the temperature drops the entire system starts giving all sorts of false positives and false negatives that end technology is still sending out that information all those false positives and false negatives to its patients and telling and giving them that wrong information there's nothing to stop it just because there was one variable that was introduced that was different so i feel like even though the technology is there it's not robust enough to account for unexpected variables environmental variables that may come into the picture or just any variables so that's where data scientists are involved basically your role mostly won't be to develop new technology your role will be okay if this happens this is what the system needs to do or if, if something else happens this is how it should react and that's those scenarios is what you guys work on mostly okay you, so there's a question so, from a doctor so he just wants to know that uh, how much uh, is the scope of a doctor into the field of data science this is a reverse question till now people were asking what is the scope of data science in a, in in bio, bio sciences and now he is asking how can a doctor help in this field of data science and uh, how can uh, data science help in treating uh, diseases like alzheimers autism and other genetic diseases got it and when you say doctor this is a physician or a phd uh i that that's not mentioned i think he he may be okay. ambiguous yeah okay got it um honestly i would say it's more difficult for someone who's a physician and who has a biology background to come into data science because they've left um statistics and maths a long time ago and they focus completely on the human body so uh for them to kind of contribute to the field of data science might be a little more difficult just because there's so much of technology involved frankly speaking it might be as difficult as getting another degree like getting a masters maybe in data science so that is some that is the level of um effort that you know someone who who's a physician may, may need to go into and the second part of your question uh, could you repeat that yeah what is the application of data science and uh, i mean collaboration of data science and a doctor to cure diseases like alzheimers autism uh, other genetic diseases yeah So in that I would say that mostly the place where doctors help us is they tell us where improvements can be made and at the end at the end of the day what we're doing is we're providing the tools that a doctor needs in order to carry out his or her job successfully so as long as physicians are able to give us that feedback that basically it can be as simple as you know this needs improvement this is not up to the mark i wish i had this so i could do this better simple things like that that's where you know that feedback comes from and, and those improvements are ultimately what help the physicians so one final question uh, a very generic question uh, where do you see this collaboration of data science and bioscience and engineering 5 uh, years down the line um i think there's a lot of potential definitely um just in uh uh gene sequencing next gen sequencing is one area that i do see uh uh you know going very forward and then of course we have tools that will make us do our jobs faster so ai and by and, and just healthcare technology as well as being able to uh sort through uh data in, at a faster rate which ultimately means that um in general in very simple like consumer terms your wait times in your hospitals will reduce you will no longer have to wait days for a test it can literally be done in a matter of minutes by the time you're done taking it in the waiting room you get your results right so simple things like that to complex things like having um automated a uh, certain level of automated surgeries this is already existing like for example we have the da vinci robot um and if you guys are familiar with that it's it's basically um a huge um 
it it looks like that villain from Spider Man, um, the one with the multiple arms. <laughs> but <laughs> basically, what that robot does is it allows anyone sitting in any part of the world to perform the surgery. So if there is a physician who is who wants to do the surgery, it can. And the next goal is that that robot should be able to do some simple procedures by itself. So there's literally no human interaction. So things like these definitely call out for you know biomedical engineers as well as data scientists. And there is a, a large sp scope, especially because everyone has started realizing the importance of funding um, healthcare related initiatives so we don't land up in another pandemic again. So finally, we are coming towards the end of the session. So it was our privilege to invite you as our special guest. So I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation and giving a detailed analysis of all the questions which were asked today. So I would now request Ronak to officially end this session and give a vote of thanks. Yeah, so on behalf of IIT Madras uh, PS community, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Saloni Verma for joining. And uh, I think she has uh, she's uh, she has been very nice to take out time for us on a Sunday morning, where I think most of the people would like to sleep for a longer time. So thank you so very much for uh, doing this, and uh, thank you very much uh, everyone who has joined uh, in the webinar. Uh, I think uh, uh, would you like to say something on a final note uh, to to all the students of IIT Madras? Definitely. Um, so good luck to everyone, you know, whether you're exploring uh, and uh, hoping to get a job in the field of healthcare or just exploring the idea of studying abroad and getting another degree. Uh, you guys are, are definitely, you know, young, motivated students. You have a long way ahead of you. So don't be afraid to, you know, explore different career paths. It's, it's one thing that I did and, and I'm really happy about it. Just try out different things. If you don't like it, you try something else. There's never a deficiency of things to try out, um, especially with uh, with the degree that you guys have. So try to merge it with whatever you like to do, because ultimately the, the goal is in your career, whatever you decide, you do need to be happy. And that really does matter. Yeah, Dipanjani, would you like to say something? No, with this, we would officially like to end this session. Thank you, ma'am, for joining. And thanks, guys. You joined in such numbers. You registered in such numbers. You sent your questions. You got them answered. So thanks a lot from our side. Thank you, yeah. everyone. Take care. Thank Bye. you, everyone.